Hello, everybody, and welcome to what I consider to be now sort of an expanding educational experiment to see to what degree YouTube can be used as a platform to deliver real educational content to people. And I have gone back to making videos after a long hiatus. And when I looked at first started doing it, I read some sort of algorithm that said that most people watch only very short videos. And so it's if you make a longer video, you're kind of wasting your time. And so I kind of made an effort in my first few videos in this uh, resurrection to keep them short. And then they started getting longer and longer. And people still seem to be interested in what I had to say. And so I kind of figured, well, what the hell, I I'd kind of like to give a full scale lecture. Let's see what happens if I do that. And so that's what I did last time. I gave, uh, I offered the time before last to do a series of sort of an introductory overview to um, what I call polyliteracy using as a textbook, this old -er book, How to New Ways to Learn a Foreign Language by Robert A. Hall, a prominent linguist of the 20th century and an inventor of the spoken language series methodology type thing that was used to train soldiers in World War II. And, um, very prominent person in his time. And it's a book that I don't think is widely known in the world, but among the polyglot circle, people know about it. It's, it's a very good guide that says, what can we do to help people prepare to learn a foreign language? Not a particular language, but it's just a language in general. What do you need to know in order to embark upon the successful study of a foreign language? What are you going to encounter? And so I thought I'll summarize this and I'll, I'll comment on it because I'm writing my own book along the same lines and this would be helpful. So um, I delivered that lecture last time on this book has five parts. And as I was planning to do that, I thought, well, you know, when I give a classroom lecture, I'm, I'm used to talking for an hour or 75 minutes or an hour and a half, but I, I don't talk nonstop. I, I engage with my class. I ask the students what they're thinking. I, I encourage them to ask questions. And in this format, we can't do that. And so I thought, well, I get all these questions that come into the comment uh, section, but can't really answer them there. So I've been doing question and answer sections, but that, 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 that's not very satisfactory. And I know that some people do live streams where the people are there and sending things in the chat and the person is sitting there answering. And I didn't seem satisfactory either. So I knew about this format of discussion circles, which I've been sort of in using and, and, and more and more um, over the past two years really to, uh, to, to teach or to, to lead reading and discussion circles for adult learners, continual, continuing learners of, of German say. So it's a reading and discussion section in German where people come in a small group and everybody's read the same thing and we read and talk about it and read aloud. And it works well with that and sort of a, a, for using a language. And I thought, well, that should work well for a topic as, as well. So if you're not familiar with a discussion circle, the concept, it's, you're probably more familiar with a seminar. A seminar is when instead of a professor lecturing at the front of the room, everybody sits around a table and, and talks. Um, seminars are smaller than lectures in general, but seminars tend to have about 10, 12, 15 people. And in a seminar, um, some people can sort of sit there quietly or doze off and others can dominate the talk. Whereas in a discussion circle, I view it as the job of the, the, the leader, the moderator, the teacher to try to see that everybody maybe doesn't speak the exact same amount of time, but they get an equal number of turns. Everybody goes around. And so in my concept of a discussion circle, um, it would be a little larger than what we have here today. I was thinking maybe three or four people. Uh, and a lot of people signed up, had interest, but uh, I think there's time differences and things getting started. So we have a small circle today consisting of me and of Matthew, who is an American resident in China, and William, who is a Brazilian in Brazil. And so yes. let me stop talking for a little bit and let them introduce themselves a little bit more. And then we'll go to a discussion of some of the questions that came into the comments about the video. And then the three of us will sit and talk about the themes that were raised in, in the lecture that I gave last Tuesday. So uh, William, you were the first one here. Would you like to introduce yourself? Let people know who you are and what your interest is in terms of polyglottery, polyliteracy, all the kinds of things that I've been talking about. Uh, uh, 
first of all, thanks for having me, Dr. Alexander, in this, this experiment that you, you have now, this wonderful discussion. And my name is William, but you can call me Will if you want. And I, like the doctor said, I'm a Brazilian and I live, and I live in Brazil right now. I've learned English throughout Google Translate. People say that Google Translate is bad, but I've learned through Google Translate. And I'm here. I'm now learning Japanese, Latin, and ancient Greek. And this idea of polyliteracy always struck with me. I always loved reading. I didn't have a word for it. Now mm -hmm. I have it. Thanks to Dr. Alex now. Thank you, Dr. You're very welcome. You're very welcome. So, William, you've been watching my videos for some time, but you look pretty young, so we must have seen them when they were like, you know, they must have been out for a while. Matthew, uh, you and I, we actually kind of go back a while, don't we? I mean, to, you know, we've uh, crossed paths, at least in writing, decades ago, did we not? Yes. Um, uh, yeah, I was still in university. I, I had a a uh, peculiar job then that allowed me to listen to audio a lot and we did a one hour kind of consultation <laughs> and I think the the quote that stuck with me I mean the most surprising quote that stuck with me uh, from that time was uh, uh are you sure you can listen I don't want you to get run over by the lawnmower <laughs> um <laughs> all right yeah um we did have that consultation it was probably in 20, uh, 2008, 2009, maybe. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've applied a lot of those ideas throughout uh, the years in various ways uh, until now, yeah. Mm -hmm. And you are an ESL teacher in Beijing, is that right? Yeah, um, I, uh, I started that way uh, so that, well, I came to China so that I could uh, focus on Mandarin and then to stay here longer I got into teaching uh, English um, and then I got some other kind of niche qualifications. I, I do teacher training now for English teachers for uh, kind of it's kind of a dogmatic way of teaching English. It's mm -hmm. for the Cam Cambridge CELTA program. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay and you are you've got about seven languages under your belt would you say? Um, I'm, I think I'm really good at getting to uh, uh, B1. <laughs> um, I, I, I would say, yeah, probably seven, yeah. Mm -hmm. yep. And uh, one of the most gratifying things, you know, when, when you put the effort to provide some content, like, like I do, is then when you turn around, and you look in the comment section and you see, Hey, there's a real discussion going here. There's people that are really engaging and asking questions and, and talking to each other. And Matthew, I would say you're one of the strongest voices out there. I mean, um, I, I was I'm flabbergasted that this latest video has been seen 1,750 times now, um, and that's uh, kind of really surprising to me, uh, given how long it is. It's over an hour, and Google Analytics or the or whatever the YouTube analytics is telling me that about a third of the people are watching it all the way through and that it's getting in general viewed for a lot longer than, um, than most videos are. I wonder if maybe a lot of those views aren't from you watching it over and over again and making more and more comments. <laughs> no, <laughs> just once, just once, yeah. I was meaning to do it twice. <laughs> right. Well, let's, let's talk about the comments that um, some of the people made who, who couldn't be with us today. Um, so that we're sure that we answer any questions that people had to the video. And then the three of us can sit and, and just talk about things that are prompted in your minds um, by last week, one Tuesday's video and just some other general questions that you'd like to ask me or things for us to talk about. So um, can you help me out? What are some of the questions or uh, serious comments that people uh, made to the video that we should address? Okay. Can I start? Can mm -hmm. I start? Please do. Yeah, you were the first one here. You go first. Okay, so it's it's really difficult because the the comment section is a little bit chaotic. But uh -huh. I've been 
I've been seeing a uh, renewed interest in intensive breeding, intensive mm -hmm. breeding, because now we have electronic dictionaries. You you know about the research that Paul Nation did. Mm -hmm. It was most with paper dictionaries. I didn't read everything, but it was in 2000. So I believe it was on paper dictionaries. Has anything grew because our online dictionary is a lot easier. In fact, without the online dictionary, my English would be as good as it is now. Or mm -hmm. could be worse, I don't know. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts, Dr. <clears throat> Alexander, in this regard? Um, well, uh, when I was in Singapore um, at the Regional Language Center, they had an annual conference and um, he came to those and I was, I did, I made a video about extensive reading at that point and I used his research to, um, to go into the back of that. And so we talked about it, he and I personally talked about uh, the whole concept there. And that would have been about maybe 2011, 2012, so 10 years ago, about, you know, in between the date that you mentioned in this year. And I'm sorry, I honestly can't remember uh, whether um, it was, you know, talking about you know, the whole concept of, of, of using dictionaries in at that point was electronic or, um, or paper. And just um, to be the, the devil's advocate old man, I certainly see the benefit of electronic dictionaries in terms of the speed and getting to something I mean, that would be able to look up things much more rapidly. But um, I think that a good paper dictionary that forces you to sort of go through and find things and look for things you see similar words and related words and you have to sort of dig a little bit more through it and maybe you'll come to the wrong conclusion but if you're digging I think you're, you're you have to be a bit more conscious about saying am I choosing the right meaning the right definition whereas when you just look something up like I don't know on uh, on, on, on an Amazon Kindle you can highlight the word and the definition comes up and you tend to just sort of accept it and say oh that's what it is without questioning it further so you if you learned English by Google and electronic dictionaries, you're a living testimony to the fact that that can be very good and very effective. So um, mm -hmm. I wouldn't put out a, a, a word against it, but just a word of caution that, well, yeah, okay. The speed of the dictionary ought not to just, you know, enable me to run through it. I ought to yeah, think, is this really what the word means? Is this, just give it a check. I don't know. I mean, my thoughts on the matter are, are Various. I, I have many things. I no, don't have an exact position on the matter mm -hmm. yet. But what I think is, for example, I'm learning Japanese right now. Mm -hmm. when, I'm, when I'm reading Japanese, I am using a Japanese English dictionary, correct? And there are times that there are words that I don't know in English. So I translate from Japanese to English, and there is no there's nothing there and I don't understand. I, what I do, I look at the word on the monolingual dictionary in English. There's this recursive thing go, going on. So I think it's good for people when they want to learn a third language or a fourth language and in a language they already know, but not to a high level. So they can kind of, I would say multitask in a sense, because my English is okay. I would love to get it better, but I'm more interested in Japanese right now. I think the more value is on Japanese. Mm -hmm. So through, through Japanese, I'm getting better at English. I think it's useful in this, this matter. If I would use paper dictionaries in this sense, that would be insane, especially mm -hmm. in Japanese, especially in Japanese. Now, I, I, I've always agreed with exactly with what you just said, that it makes sense to, um, use, to use, use a different language to learn a third language. So you get the practice in both. I've always had, I mean, you're as a native Brazilian, a native speaker of another language, it makes sense for you to use English, like you just said, to, to learn another language. For native English speakers, I've always said that we ought to learn um, French and German first, because there's so many good resources to use in French and German. And then once you've gotten them relatively good, then yes, use a, use a French, I don't know, a French Korean dictionary or a German Korean dictionary. Uh, that way you'll be practicing the two at once. 
Matthew, did you want to throw out a question of your own or that somebody else posed? Yes, I, I just had one. Uh, I just had one that I was looking at. Um, I'm trying to scroll through them. Which one was the one where you said we need to just we need to touch on this in the discussion circle? Do you remember what that comment was? Uh, I think it was a woman's name, Catherine, maybe something. And she had like a two-pronged question. That's about, right. Yeah, you know, learning types and motivation or something along those lines. Okay. I haven't found that one yet, but I found one uh, about the con the prepared conversation launch. Or do you want okay. to discuss more uh, specifically about uh, the content from the book? Um, uh, just anything from the lecture that, you know, that, that stems your you know, mind, if that was part of the thing that comes up. Right. Um, when, for example, the prepared conversation launch, this is when uh, you know that you'll be in over your head uh, in mm -hmm. a kind of situation with a proficient speaker of a language and you've prepared for it, you know what the topic is. Uh, you're going, I, I suppose you're using realia or real objects around you. Um, and I, I saw you were, there's like an acorn or something and you were trying to practice, I don't know, prepositional things or uh, of motion, <laughs> some grammatical uh, yeah, aspect of the so language. Uh, yeah, I, I referred back to the uh, the two uh, the two videos that I left up of my Finnish mm -hmm. experience. So you're referring back to the one that was more of a TPR, total physical response, nature walk, and sort of I'm shadowing what he says, a live shadowing thing. Mm -hmm. uh, it was in the other video that I talked about, what I called the prepared conversation launch, where um, I'd been there a couple of weeks and I had some structure now and I knew how to things and I wasn't you know I wanted to talk about religion and philosophy and he was a guy who was into religion and philosophy too and so um, I looked up those words I looked up the structure I tried to plug it in and so I sort of had the conversation prepared in my mind um, that uh, I could go and, and, and have it with him but I think the key point there is that um, I don't at that level, I mean, I think when you're at a higher level, it might work if you go out into the world as a whole. You know, I certainly, mm -hmm. I mean, yes, when I've lived in foreign countries, yeah, I mean, and, and, you know, I would always look up, you know, some things, okay, what am I likely to do today? And basically did that, you know, this is, this is vocabulary I'm going to need to go into this situation and prepare for it that way. Um, but that was when I was at a higher level. This year, I'm, I'm really still at a very, very, very low level in, in Finnish. I've only been in it two weeks and it's a totally different language, but um, the key there is that he was a very, very good teacher. He was a highly trained teacher. He, he knew exactly how to teach. He had a lot of methodology in him. And he also knew that I knew more than he did. I had more experience than he did. He didn't have a problem with that. He didn't have a problem saying, okay, I'm going to let you, I'll, I'll let you use me as a dictionary, basically. I'll let you um, take charge of the learning process, and I will be the resource that you can learn from. Um, and so I don't think that most people um, are capable of doing what he did. I mean, it would be kind of like for most people, if, if, you, if you were speaking as slowly as I am, if you're having the, in Finnish there, you're having struggling as much. You know, if you're just trying to talk to some average person who's not a trained language teacher, who's not there to help you learn the language, I don't think they would have the patience for that. But if you're working with a, a that's that's something um, that a good teacher uh, can do. There are, you know, there is. I love. I'm as I talked about in that video, and as you both know, anybody who's known me, I I definitely think that you can teach a language to yourself better than a teacher can teach it to you. But there are things that a teacher can do that you you can't do by yourself, and and that's that's one thing is to really help you uh, get started in that way. And this would probably be a teacher who needs to suspend uh, maybe their training that they had before, if they had training, because of, I mean, uh, uh, yeah, any kind of teacher training course I've seen, it's really kind of prescriptive with techniques and what the teacher mm -hmm. does. This one is uh, really more about uh, I, I suppose prompting or you're mm -hmm. really focusing on what the teacher is saying and it language that emerges. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 Um, 
let's let's try to find that uh, that lady's questions about uh, the vision of language type because I, I think it ties into that. It would work well with that if I'm recalling from the, my memory. I don't have it in front of me. I don't, um, but it was something about is the whole idea of um, learner types, the division of types oh. into kinesthetic and and auditory and physical. Is that is that what did you find it? Is, is that she, yes? Is that a I found it. What did she say exactly? Um, uh, so this was Tyra, I think. Mm -hmm. um, she says, uh, I've come across the statement that the division of learners into kinesthetic, auditory, visual, et cetera, is arbitrary and there's a myth in language learning. Do you agree with it? Um, yes, that's the first question. Uh -huh. Well, let's talk about that. Well, what do you think? <clears throat> do you understand that question? What do you think of it? Yeah, I understand the question. Like she is asking if those divisions of learning of kinesthetic, auditory, visual, those you think real? are just. Hmm? Do you think those are real? I think they are overemphasized. I think they're overemphasized. They're not fake. They are real for sure. Mm -hmm. There are people that do like more to to see images. They're like more people that like to hear, so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. For you can see even this on our, our own community. For example, there are many language learners that love to talk, love to hear other people. And there are other language learners that just love to see the text. For example, mm -hmm. for me, for example, when I'm talking to other people in English, I sometimes plunk in my, my understanding. I say, can you write for me? When the person writes or or spells the word for me, I understand automatically because I process more visually than through auditorial. So I can see this happening. The question is that we as language learners cannot focus on one single of those, those study methods. Mm -hmm. We need to focus on the whole. We need mm -hmm. to be able to process language in many different ways, be it visual, be it through, through auditory means, mm -hmm. and so on and so forth. And not only that, the culture, and mm -hmm. of course, the cuisine of related to people that speak the language, and so on and so forth. I don't think this is super important on the long run. On the short run, when we start, yeah, maybe this helps, maybe this helps, makes the process learning easier on the start, but when you get more advanced, it's better to forget and focus on the whole. Matthew, what do you think? Do you think it's a myth, this division of things? I mean, with your experience in the classroom? <clears throat> All right, well, um, um, uh, several years ago, uh, we just called them uh, learning styles. And then I think about 2016, there were some minor changes in the syllabus that we teach from, and now we call it learner preferences. But then the kind of old school teacher trainers just, they're like, oh, it's the same thing. These people, they don't <laughs> believe this stuff. Um, okay, so I, I think that, uh, every, well, the people who I know who uh, talk to me about this, they say, and I think that, um, I think we're just being a bit too picky with uh, terminology. I think that th they call it pseudo, well, it's called pseudoscience, I think, by the experts, um, this division of learning, because apparently we live, I mean, we learn best in a variety of ways, not just necessarily the one that we think is our style. We have preferences. Um, I think that definitely the more that you're doing, the better. Um, uh, I feel that I do have a preference and I, I don't know if it's really a style necessarily. Um, I, I see the value of being aware of those three, whether you call them styles or preferences and probably getting a, uh, a balance of some kind. For example, I mean, a blind shadowing seems to be on the kinesthetic side or just mm -hmm. keeping with the book and keeping your mouth shut seems a bit too focused on auditory. <laughs> I mm -hmm. mean, yeah, um, right. Yeah. yeah, so I, I, think, I think it's important to know 
and important to get a balance of them. I'm not sure if, if we have really a style though. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I would not regard it as a myth. I mean, yeah, like what you said, William, I mean, it can be overblown and if, you know, the, you know, you can have maybe a preference of way you prefer to do things, but you know, if this is, you know, if you want to learn a language and the only resource is, is a book, um, you know, then you just have to, to use the book to do it. But if you've got a variety of different things that you could do, um, certainly. I mean, just, uh, you just mentioned, you mentioned shadowing again. I mean, look at the um, basic, I don't know. I think there's a, the, a lot of people who question shadowing do it because they, they, just, they just can't wrap their heads around moving around while they learn a language. I mean, just that, that just, they're, they're so unkinesthetic that the idea of doing anything like that, they just can't wrap their heads around. <laughs> And there are certainly people who can, um, yeah, who, you know, who, who love to sit down and, and look at grammars and there are others that it's not, I wouldn't even say it's a preference. They just, they don't have the mind to do that. I mean, it, they just can't process information that way. And then flip it around, there are people that can, that can do things um, through just sort of, you know, pattern drill training, behavioristic type things. So, um, yeah, I think it's, I, I wouldn't throw this baby out with the bathwater. I don't, I don't think it's a myth. I, you know, I don't spend a lot of time analyzing, okay, William, you're a kinesthetic learner. You ought to do this. Whereas <laughs> you're a visual learner. You ought to do that. It's, it's worth yeah. knowing about. What else? But doctor, what other... suppose, huh? suppose, um, oh, your cat is over there. Um, Merlin. Yeah, yeah, this what is your style and... then? What, what is my style? style? Mm -hmm. um, what do you consider yourself as having a style then? Uh, what are the what are the styles again? What are the official ones? I mean, I'm just, I'm obviously uh, aesthetic. I'm get, definitely get visual, it. auditory, gustatory. I'm not gustatory. I don't learn languages by taste. <laughs> Basically, all the five senses, doctor. Basically, all the five senses. All the five senses. Learn yeah. through the five senses. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I like what you just said earlier, William, too. I mean, you could, I mean, we're joking now, but I think that you could use the sense of smell and the sense of taste to learn a language in a sense in that this gets back to the, the, the sort of reasons and motivations. And what I mentioned in my commentary expanding of the reasons that, that Hall gave is that if you can develop cultural, you can take cultural curiosity and develop into cultural affinity, that gives you more motivation to do the language. So yeah, I mean, if you if you're studying Hindi and you you know and you like the smells of strong spices and the taste of Indian food, you're going to be more motivated to you know go and be in that atmosphere. Whereas if you if, if, I mean, we all know that, I mean, there's just certain smells that like, for whatever reason, some people like them, but other people find them, oh, I'm going to vomit if I smell that. I, I hate the way that yes. tastes. So you will have a hard time learning a language if you, if you don't like the way the, the food smells and tastes. So maybe we oughtn't write that out. Yeah. Oh, hey, yeah. 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 Um, let's, let's make sure we cover all the questions there uh, and then we can just continue our own discussion. Was there something else that somebody raised that we ought to look at? I think that's it. There was a two, that lady had a, what was her name? Tanya? Yeah. She had a two-part question. What was Tyra Sokolova. Um, yeah, so the second one, I'm still on the way of, of figuring out my way of learning languages and trying out new methods. But one mm -hmm. of the problems is feeling, is the feeling of being overwhelmed by keeping up with all the methods, juggling them in my head and remembering what I've already tried and what results it gave. What would be the way of figuring out one set of language learning methods without burning out? Okay. Um, yeah, obviously that question is playing off of her first part of the question about learning styles. So um, to just pick up there, I would say, well, at least have some inkling of your learning style. Uh, and then there's no need to try methods or techniques or things that are um, outside of your zone. So that's one way of limiting it down, you know, whittling down the, the ways that you might want to try to learn. If you have, you know, we're, we're presuming that you're talking about a widely studied language that has any number of different resources and any number of different ways you could learn it. So you can say, well, I don't need these. Those aren't really appropriate to me. There's no need to try every method under the sun. Um, I would say, you know, if once you start trying, there's no point in saying, okay, yeah, this works. And let me stop. I'm, my goal is to learn the language, but 
I want to see if I got the best <clears throat> methods. I'm going to stop now and try a different method. I mean, I would say no. If the goal is to learn the language, if you've got a method that's working, keep working with it. Keep learning the language, and then you can do something else. Uh, I would also say that basically, um, you know, if you're going to learn techniques and methods like you guys are doing kind of here from me, um, you know, it's because just somehow, I mean, yeah, that's, that's one of the beautiful things about YouTube as a community for polyglottery. I mean, there are, um, there are lots of people out there that are willing to share their experience. And so before you go trying different methods, I would say you could, you know, look at different, look at different people who are sharing and say, well, I, I click with that person. I seem to have like, I like her personality. I like her attitude, or I like the way he, he does things. And if you find somebody that you can click with, um, then uh, probably you'll be able to use the, the same kind of methods. Whereas, you know, if you're just saying, okay, I want to try out all the methods and here's somebody, and I don't really, I don't feel like I have right vibes with him, but I'm going to try his methods. That, that doesn't make any sense. I don't know. You've tried plenty of methods, haven't you, William? Tell us about the methods you've tried. And how did you how did you settle on the ones that you did? This is a seg a perfect segue to to my question right now. Okay, great. doctor, would you put um, some English videos on your channel for us to shadow? Focus more on to shadow, so we have a clear enunciation. Also, a script for us to read, mm -hmm. and also get the audio because I I do find your voice rather calming and soothing and i do find your vocabulary a lot enticing as well so I you'd like to see a, a transcript of my um you know i i don't know i mean what if i've, I've, I've imagined other incarnations what else i could do in this life and i because i love to work with um audio books for native speakers i thought it'd be fun to read an audio book or something like that i've, well, I've tried to do something like that. But basically, if you're looking at um, something to shadow, if you had any of my videos, like my last video, the lecture, you know, if you like that. Um, so you're saying if you had a written transcript of that, that that would help you to shadow it? Mm -hmm. Because as I, as I already said to you, doctor, I mm -hmm. process a lot better when I have the written text. That's why I'm more mm -hmm. towards polyliteracy and not really towards polyglottery. Mm -hmm. Understandable, understandable. Well, I think that there are people with far, far more technical um, know-how than I do. And I know that one man at least has taken, there's, there's a way to get a transcript of, you know, a, a printout of things, but it's, I don't think there, um, I think there's probably a lot of errors in them. So, but um, yeah, that's something we could consider at least finding one or two and, and getting those transcripts and getting the errors out. Yeah, sure. Why not? Matthew, how have you gone through methods and settled on the ones that you uh, have, have liked? Yeah, I think because, um, how have I done it? I, I, I guess I, I don't think that I think too much about what I do. I just, or, all right, um, from the onset, it was always my way of learning languages. It, it was from, I was most influenced by that, how to learn any languages forum. And I was in, I was a high schooler then. Um, so I can't remember the, the person who set that website up. Uh, Francois Philippe, something, Philippe, Philippe Francois, oh. Philippe, who's a Swiss guy, I forget. Yeah. So, yeah. Francois, um, so I was, <laughs> uh, I was trying to uh, read a book and looking, and I was looking up every word. And I think looking back at it, I just had uh, the basic grammar and I couldn't have had more than a thousand words under my mm -hmm. belt, but I didn't know any better. Um, mm -hmm. I read a bit more, oh, flashcards, okay. And then I did that, uh, I've done that several times. Um, but then if you get such a huge stack, then mm -hmm. uh, you just that space repetition, and it can be quite boring. So I tried that, and I've tried that several times. I've tried it through Anki, I mean, just over, ever since I was maybe 15, I'm 35 now. So I guess 20 years I've gone back to it again and again. I think just this last year, I decided I'm not going back to it ever. <laughs> um, because if you just have one language or two, it's fine. But if you're doing something, if you've got 10 languages and 
it's, it's too much to do in a day. And if you have a text that you can revisit, then that's a much better use of time, I feel. So mm -hmm. I've, I didn't write it down. I just kind of, uh, maybe it was emotional. I just felt like I'm not doing that because it doesn't make me feel good. Mm -hmm. um, so I've done a lot of shadowing. I was just thinking of it. I must have done it for the first time um, back in before 2010 or around 2010 when you made those videos and thinking about it I was just thinking how much I didn't actually think about what I do because I was using the whole time noise canceling earphones and I was just thinking about it a, um, a few months ago like is that a good idea <laughs> because I can't, because I can't hear what I'm saying really, or it's muffled. No, no, it's not a good idea. Right, not, and then, no. and then I was thinking about that, and I just put it aside and just kept going with my really expensive uh, beats. And then um, the other day, uh, there was like a recommendation on YouTube. It was some uh, Zoom recorded Zoom kind of like not really a lecture, but you met with a group of. I guess high schoolers, I'm not sure. And you were talking about like shadowing in scriptorium, doing it three times a day. Maybe it was for Concordia, I'm not sure. Um, but you recommended not using noise canceling head, micro, uh, headphones. And I thought, God, why didn't I just think more about what I was doing? <laughs> um, be, because now I'm using the cheap, uh, really cheap ones with the wire and um, yeah, I wonder if my pronunciation would have gotten a lot better. Um, mm -hmm. I was doing, I was inspired by your 15 minutes a day, 15 minutes a slot for each language, or maybe you weren't doing for one language, just 15 minutes a day, but 15 minute slots. I did that pretty well. It mm -hmm. worked pretty well for about three months, uh, but I stretched myself too thin that I decided I probably shouldn't start 10 new languages at once. <laughs> I stopped that. I, mm -hmm. I think um, uh, I have a real hard time with trying, trying to decide what works well with me and what doesn't. Um, but I'm starting to think more, I think, mm -hmm. about um, what I should do and what I shouldn't. In the last video, you said there are a lot of people who say that they know what the problem is, but they're not thinking about why they have that problem or mm -hmm. what to do about it. So I, I suppose that's, that's <laughs> what we need, right? Yeah, we need to think. Right. So Matthew, you you have this book, all right? Yes. You, mm -hmm. You've read this. William, do you have the book? I don't have the book. You don't have the book, and you're a textual reader. Matthew, would you recommend it to get it? Is it worth getting? I mean, let's let's go back to the structure, the the part one of the video, the uh, part one of the book, as I commented on it last time. What what did you learn from the lecture, William? What was the most interesting thing of that that Hall said or that I commented that you learned from the, the lecture last time? I mean, there was a lot of methods I didn't didn't heard about, and I. It's not too much about the specifics. I kind of understood of what all they meant. I love a lot the structure you put them. You said that when the old people, the old people like the Latin, the, the Roman people, the Greeks, when they're doing the scriptorium, they put some comments about the book. And I, I do some scriptorium. I'm, I'm starting... I have a two weeks or so, I think, of scriptorium, and I never thought of that. Like, oh, I can put some comments about it, mm -hmm. and I can enrich my scriptorium technique. And I didn't thought about it because mm -hmm. my learning career was is still very chaotic in a sense because I learned English, but I had uh, five thousand words, so I was basically conversation. I, I watched a lot of videos on YouTube and then I decided, you know, Japanese, I'm going to learn Japanese. And then I, I started looking around and I just go, wow, many characters and um, hiragana, katakana, how am I going to do this? I started looking into videos of language learning 
And I was flabbergasted to, um, to see that I understood nothing to it. I even saw some of your videos now, and I researched a lot. I read a lot in English. That was not exactly fun because it was fairly recently that I finally eliminated my, my, my mother language, that is Portuguese. I now can function 100% in English. I can use a monolingual dictionary and so on and so forth. But this is very recent advancement. I think I started in 2017. So it's very recent. At the time that I started learning Japanese as well. So you can see that there was a lot of things going on in my mind. And then I started loving the process and finding it beautiful. And uh, I, I commit a lot of errors. I started accepting out the languages like, oh, how about some Russian? How about some Georgian? Oh, Hebrew. Oh, Spanish, Italian. That didn't go so well for me. So I decided to focus a little bit more. In fact, I'm now learning Latin Greek because of English, because mm -hmm. of English. So then I can finally understand more English. That it's the, those are the sources of the vocabulary, uh, is, yeah. Yes, it's even something I want to ask you, doctor. Is there some way I did I did the vocabulary test and I got between 10 and 15,000. The vocabulary test is a lot wavy. I got mm -hmm. between 10 and 15,000 word families. Mm -hmm. Is there some way that I can jump that 5,000 less because I I read a lot I read a lot and it doesn't seem to translating language ability so much. I still get a lot caught on the words sometimes, mm -hmm. especially in high level discussions. For example, when we're having right now, I take one or two seconds to process what, ev what everything everyone is saying right now. Mm -hmm. So the question is how can you, if you, you know, you can test, uh, take the and test to say, you know, 15,000 language families and you wanna know 20,000 to be better able to read a novel. Is there a way to jumpstart that? Um, not overnight, but um, these are just some of the techniques that I think, you know, that are floating around out there is that um, if you um, work with a text, a novel, something whose content you know already, so you can read something that, you know, if you have, you can find an English translation of a Brazilian novel or vice versa, if you can uh, read that, uh, in Portuguese first and know the content very thoroughly, um, then when you read it in English a week later, um, you will be able to follow more than if you, if you didn't have it. So that's one way to do it. Um, but um, yeah, I mean, it's not, there's not, you can't just sort of put those extra things in there. Um, it sounds like you do a lot of reading already and mm -hmm. you just have to do that over time. I mean, uh, it helps also if you are want to stuff. And, and it's interesting that um, different authors really have at that level, the vocabulary is different. So I would say it would behoove you to say, okay, I want to, I want to learn, read, you know, read, read one author prolifically. I mean, don't jump around and read a book by this guy, read by that guy. If you read five books by the same author, he will use that same higher level vocabulary more frequently, you'll encounter it more frequently and it will stick with you. Whereas if you read books by a wide variety of authors, that might be interesting, but everybody has his own idiomatic phrases and words that he uses. And so you, you won't encounter the same ones. So I would say those two things, read stuff that you kind of can somehow read in translation first and um, read, the, read, read a, a single author's, read, read several books by him. Um, that might help. But it's not some even that that's not going to like get you there overnight, but it'll get you there faster than, than doing it otherwise. Yeah, because I've been grinding a lot since 2017, and it looks it's getting better. It's getting better, but it's it's it seems so far away sometimes. Mm -hmm. Do you have any recommendation of author that's super dense? Because I'm learning Japanese, and I think I understand like 10 or 20 percent of the text. Mm -hmm. So I'm used to intensive reading. Look, I love intensive reading. I don't, I'm not really fond of extensive reading because I love vocabulary mm -hmm. in particular. So mm -hmm. what makes me reading through novels is not really the plot because I'm not really interested in fiction. 
I love mm -hmm. nonfiction. I love science and other things that are not related in novels generally. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I read a novel, what interests me a vocabulary, like, oh, a word I never saw, what it means. So it's like that process of discovery that I am interested in. So do you have mm -hmm. any dense, very dense authors that use uh, immense vocabulary? You have to like the person's style. I mean, there are plenty of Japanese authors that are, are well, I'm thinking of, what's his name? Har Hariko Murakami, I think is um, the wild, the wind up Murakami? bird. Is, is it Mur Murakami? I think so. I'll have to think off the top of my head. But yeah, there's, mm. there's a Japanese author. He, he writes in the magical realistic style. Um, and uh, he's, yeah, he's written, uh, I think IQ 1984, the Wind Up Bird Chronicles. Um, he's also a long distance runner and he wrote a book on what I think about when I run. That's nonfiction. Uh, that might be a good introduction to him. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll give it some thought. I'll come up with his name. It's, it's, it's at the tip of my tongue. Um, Matthew. Any English doctor, do you have anyone in English as well? In English? Mm -hmm. Moby Dick. <laughs> <laughs> um, do you like magical realism? The style of of magical realism. Um, I I, as I told you yeah. already, Doctor. Yeah. I'm not too much into novels. Yeah. I'm a yeah. question of vocabulary. But you, but you want one with a high vocabulary. Salman Rushdie. Give Salman Rushdie a chance. As long as not Hapax Legomena, please. Okay. No Hapax <laughs> Legomena. Okay. That's that's a no no. Please. Okay. All right. Yeah. <laughs> That's my father's book of poetry. <laughs> Matthew, did you have a question? Anything you wanted to throw at um, me? Yeah, we were, um, we were looking at the book, yeah? Um, yeah. Something what, did you, that, what did you learn from the, yeah. uh, going, now that I jarred your memory or made, had you mm -hmm. read them before or was it just gathering dust on your shelf? Gathering dust. <laughs> um, <laughs> I mean, uh, up there with uh, the loom of language. <laughs> uh -huh. um, let's see. Um, uh, in chapter two, he goes over the uh, what you call the gambit of uh, of attitudes toward. I mean, he has, I guess, the attitudes towards uh, language like language learning in general. And to me, it doesn't seem like it must have. I don't think it's changed too much. Mm -hmm. um, you did go through each each uh, kind of main comment and and kind of give your thoughts on it as well. Um, but he must have been, I, I don't know, that, uh, it's weird uh, to be someone who studies many languages. So in his day, before the internet, he must have been seen by many as Rain Man, right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so uh, yeah. I, that was just a, a comment that uh, language learning and I guess the view of learning a lot many languages actively as an adult is uh, still quite weird. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'd I'd like to talk a little bit about the the methods section as well. Sure. Sure. Yeah. Um, he kept going. I mean, he uh, there was the grammar translation uh, method, which. I guess it's just what people did. And then later people decided, oh, we'll, we'll give that a name. Um, I think it's kind of coming back. I mean, that's what people kind of automatically do anyways, um, mm -hmm. without, if they don't have much awareness about the options that there are. Um, I think the way, the reason why it gets such a bad rap in a classroom is because the sentences might be kind of contrived, I think. Um, was it in one of the linguaphone courses or it was in one, uh, I, mean, I see this in Asimil a lot where I think a contemporary teacher would say, oh, that's a, such a contrived sentence, but <laughs> um, yeah. like my, like learning personal, uh, not personal, but possessive adjectives, my, your, his, mm -hmm. her, so, it, and body parts. My hand is on his nose. My elbow <laughs> is on his shoulder, right? I mean, it's, it's really, it's ridiculous and contrived, but I mean, with language learning materials, isn't it all kind of contrived to a certain extent? Mm -hmm. um, uh, all right, so grammar translation gets a bad rap because uh, it sometimes has nonsensical sense or contrived sentences, and there's not much focus on practice, um, at least in today's classrooms. Uh, then there, he talked about the, 
that kind of get the natural and direct methods confused. Direct method is uh, Berlitz, right? Yep, yeah, Berlitz <clears throat> would fall into that. Yeah, direct method Na was, uh -huh. he described that as um, extents only using the target language, lots of repetition, and not having formal grammar. Um, okay. And the audio, uh, the army method, I thought mm -hmm. this is what became audio lingualism. So there, there was a lot of drilling the teacher model sentences and then drills and then the like substitution drills. So I go to the park and then, uh, then uh, the school, I go to the school like, mm -hmm. <laughs> like that. Um, it, the army method wasn't where audio lingualism came from. Um, well, as he describes it, I mean, yeah, the, the, well, a, a, he doesn't like calling it the army method. It was, uh -huh. he had another name for it and he was one of the inventors of it, but then the army used it. And so it became known as that. And he says, you're giving the generals and the colonels too much uh, credit. They didn't come up with it. They just used it. So I think back in the 1940s, uh, the, the recording material was relatively primitive compared to the 1960s. <clears throat> Uh, and so 1960s is when you, that's when you get really more audio lingual and you have free access to language laboratories and able to do things. So I would say that the, the, what's called the, well, the spoken language method, the, the army method is sort of a forerunner of, of audio lingual it making extensive use of recordings, which to me is the, that is probably the single biggest revolution in our ability to learn languages. I mean, you've always had been able to go and have access to another person. And, you know, there have always been trained teachers or people with patience or people that you could listen to and whatnot. But how many times could you ask somebody to repeat something over and over again? And, to, you know, they would just people would get frustrated with that. You couldn't hear the same thing when you have something recorded. Um, and that is for, for the Williams of this world recorded and with a transcript, something you can look at and something you can work with over and over again. That's why I've always been so partial to linguaphone and assimilar methods like that that provide exactly that. I mean, it might be contrived, but you know, if you can take a language and condense all the grammatical structure and a systematic approach into like two hours or so, two or three hours of straight recorded material with a transcript that you can go along with, I mean, that's not a whole language, but I think that you can take that and regard that as a representative portion of it. And if you can take that portion and more, if you're more visually by looking at the book, if you're an audio, if you're a visual type, also by listening to it, by combining both, if you can digest that, if you can really internalize that, then I think that you have an absolutely solid foundation in the language. So that's why I've always been partial, partial to those. Right. Doctor, I have a question. Sure. I have a question. Um, you're talking about the 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 ASIMU courses, the, Ber the Berlitz courses. They do provide a great base of grammar mm -hmm. and through sentences, right? Um, right. Here comes my question: Is that grammar they show enough enough so you can get away with just a voc just a dictionary? just a dictionary, a uh, uh, bilingual dictionary, it's enough, or you still need to go through grammar and learn the terms and the, the target language and still need to see through that a little more carefully because it's just too, too crass of an approach, or it's, or it's enough. Well, you're, you're talking about this, the, the ancient mm -hmm. Greek, this one here. I mean, it's got a pretty, if I recall correctly, it's got a pretty thorough grammatical section at the end. And, you know, the way it's structured, every seventh lesson is a review. Um, I, as I recall, the, the grammar in this is pretty, pretty thoroughly um, integrated. The Asimil Latin book is more of a, uh, an odd bird. Uh, it's interesting. It's, um, uh, I think they, it's also very thorough and intense, but I think that that one, uh, you go through it and you say, okay, now let me look at a straight, straight grammar and, and make sense of it. I think I have that, I know I have that here too. Um, yeah, it's also got a, a good grammatical index at the back. Is um, that the really old Latin one? It is. Yeah. They've, they've re-recorded this. So mm -hmm. um, the, the original recordings were really 
They're on records. <laughs> <laughs> well, they're on records, but also it's just like, I, that, that's interesting. I mean, that came up somebody, oh, that was one of the questions somebody asked. I mean, Latin is, a, is an example of a living language. So I think that was recorded at a time somehow when, um, and maybe it was because of, of overall communications at the time when, you know, French people spoke Latin like it was French and German spoke it like it was German. And uh, maybe, you know, German person speaking Latin could communicate with another German person, but not with a French person doing it. Um, and since then, uh, people have come back to the restored pronunciation and to the or the church pronunciation. So most Latin books, you pick it up and and you know they'll tell you you can use one of two pronunciations in order to use this um, as kind of a spoken language that you might be able um, to to communicate with. So um, yeah, I wouldn't uh, I would I would recommend a book for the the Asimo Latin, but not the recordings. Yeah. <laughs> So, well, doctor, <laughs> since you already touched the, this briefly, this 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 idea of classical languages. Suppose you didn't knew your classic languages, right? And you were start from zero. Right now, for example, suppose ancient Greek. That's the great elephant on the room for everyone because Latin we have lingua latina per se illustrata, but Mm -hmm. Or ancient Greek, we don't have such a, a thorough book. Our books are somewhat difficult. They're a little bit dry. How you, suppose you have only one hour for ancient Greek, supposing, or Latin, but let's get ancient Greek because it's the hardest in mm -hmm. this sense. Not because it's really hard, but it's because the materials are not that good. How we would address this, like one hour a day, I would address the, this problem, learning ancient Greek. Hmm. Well, ancient Greek is one language that I really learned as a college student. I didn't teach it to myself. I was in a class. I had a really good teacher. It was a really small class, and you know, and I just, you know, I was, I was like. 19, 20 years old, I just sort of did what, you know, I needed to do to, to learn the thing. I don't remember that procedure very much. And since then, Greek is not one of my stronger languages. I mean, it's there, but I just, I've never been able to give it as, as much as I could. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. I mean, um, what would I do if I just had an hour a day for, for Greek? Um, well, I just had that book in my hand. That seems like a very, very good book for a, a, a self-teaching manual. So work with that as a partial thing and then just using the, um, the techniques that I, particularly for you as a visual learner, you like the scriptorium technique, you like looking at the text. Um, I would say that, and it is a slightly different alphabet that can trip you up. So I would say that um, rather than flailing about wildly uh, with lots of different methods, because as you said, some are, are dry, um, that's a good one. Work with that in, in multiple ways. Um, there is always, um, you know, you can just get these kind of post-it stickers. And so, you know, when I, when I work through a book um, repeatedly, like, you know, I like these, um, here's Perfection en Russe, you know, you see all the stickers that I've got in here. So um, I go and I, I review one section, I review another section. So I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm going over the whole book repeatedly if I'm reviewing the Russian for this, but I'm not doing the same thing. So um, you can be at one section doing scriptorium practice with it, another section really learning, another section speaking with it uh, and working, as I said, to internalize that initial chunk of a language, um, so yeah, I would I would start with that. How's your French? Can you use the French to 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 read that, William? French? Yeah. No, I don't, don't speak French. I speak Portuguese though. Can you read? But French? I can I can read French. I can, can read. read so you can I read, read the French. French. Yeah, you can read the French to, to do that. Yeah. So. Well, that's great that you're interested in Latin and Greek. Those are wonderful languages uh, for, for polyliteracy. Matthew, do you have any ancient languages in, in, in your radar? Yes, um, I've gone to Old English uh, several times. Um, I, I got this book that was published in 
I don't know, it has that old book smell, 1926. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, it's called, uh, what's it called? The Threshold of Anglo-Saxon oh. by A.J. Wyatt. And it does start with one of those, uh, uh, what is that called? It's like, it's a primer, basically. It has a, a bunch of grammar in the front of it. And then, right. and then, it, th- then it throws you into the finding of Moses. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Um, and I worked through the first two stories, but it required, I was, uh, I guess I was looking up words the first time, and then I decided I would just go and find the Bible verses and mm-hmm. compare it, and that was working well, but then it, it changes to the story of uh, Apollonius of Tyr, and then it changes to uh, some early annals, Edward the Elder, and <laughs> so um, mm-hmm. I, I, I can't find really anything that has bilingual, like, text or anything um i've looked at gothic before um yeah oh you've got he just happens to have something on the shelf oh you want bilingual english old english and any other language yeah i don't know i think i have some stuff i'll have to dig it out Sorry. Um, yeah, that would be another thing I would say, uh, William, for like for Greek there, that too. I mean, that's something you can find lots and lots of um, bilingual texts that are interesting to you, you know, that you could use as you, I don't know if you're going to find Greek Japanese, but you can find Greek English, tons of stuff. Um, and just yeah. to the degree that you see, um, you know, even the, a good textbook getting to be boring, just say, okay, this is coming. You know, look at this and just comparing is always good. And so many English words come from Greek um, that, you know, yeah. just sort of you know, just refreshing yourself with that, you know, and just giving you that, that experience. I know I don't understand this right now. Back to that topic of sort of comparison. I'm in over my head, but I'm going to get there at some point. And now I can just, I can read this English. I know what it's saying. And I've learned enough in the book that I can read the ancient Greek aloud. And I can understand it because I just read that, and I can promise myself someday I'm, I'm going to get here. Yeah. How many t- how many times does it took uh, uh, around to get a good grasp of Greek? Not Homeric, please. Uh, Attic and uh, a little bit of Koine. How much? How do you have any idea, Doctor, to to grasp a little bit, start reading? How many hours? How many? How much? How many books? How many years? How many years? <laughs> how yeah. Many years? Um, yeah. It depends on how intensively you do it. I mean, like I said, now you you put me back into remembering my college days, and it was an in, it was intensive elementary Greek. So it was one semester. We went through. Um, I think it was Henson and Quinn's big fat. Greek books, and then in the second semester, we were, yeah, we were reading Greek, so um, if you work really intensively, so that met, I think, like, uh, like maybe two hours a day, plus your own homework, so do the math, figure that, you know, but if you, if you're motivated, and you work intensely, you, you can do it, because that is the thing about um, ancient languages, polyliterate type languages, is it's both a curse and uh, a blessing, um, that you don't have to you know, work on the pronunciation so much. You don't have to work so much on, okay, I'm having a conversation. You don't have to work on everyday vocabulary. You can go straight to the kind of vocabulary that you're going to meet and greet and the kind of texts that you're going to be reading. Um, so you can go a bit more directly, um, but you don't have, and this is the interesting part that will begin the next section, part two of uh, Hall's book for next time. Um, you, you, you know, languages start being spoken. So you need to have some sound in your head to, to read it. So Greek and Latin and Sanskrit for polyliteracy, these languages have a real advantage because some of the oldest books that we have, the oldest books in Sanskrit are, are Paninese grammar. So we know he described the sounds and the Devanagari alphabet is a very phonetic alphabet that like tells, we don't know exactly, we know for a fact that we're not pronouncing exactly the way they said it, but at least we have the structure for it. Latin, we have, through Quintilian, we have all sorts of stuff describing how the sounds were. So we have an idea of what Latin was like. And Latin has been so-called dead, but it's been you know, around for a while. But a language like Old English, or you know, how do we know what that really sounds like? That's, that's much when scholars have theories, you know, and, and we can look at things, but 
you're not going to be able to test that. You're never going to meet somebody who speaks old English. So how much time did you spend trying to get the restored thing? And how much time did you say, well, to me, I want to bring it alive. I want to be able to shadow Beowulf. I want to be able to have Beowulf be part of me. So what kind of rendition can I make to give Beowulf a living voice that it will be something that, that's exciting for me? So uh, I can't give you the exact time, but if you were to, if you were, again, because Greek, uh, ancient Greek is, you know, it's, it's a targeted language. You don't have to deal with a huge, the broad scope of vocabulary of a whole living language. Um, and you can focus on the kind of text you're going to read. I think you can probably get there. You can get there faster. Doctor, I yeah. have a question. I think that's not only me that have this interesting question. How many languages you speak and how many you can read? How many? He doesn't know how to answer that question. <laughs> uh, thank you, Matthew. I, I don't know how to answer that question. I really don't. Um, you know, it's your, how old are you, William? I'm 26. 26, okay. So 30 years from now, come back and let's have this conversation. You keep doing what you're doing. You keep learning Japanese and ancient Greek and Latin, and then you're gonna add in Russian and then you're gonna get this here. And in 30 years, come back and you'll understand why that's, you know, that's a really hard question to answer. So many languages are so closely related to each other that, um, you really, you, you have it, you, you're able to understand them um, when you learn other languages. And so you can, you know, get a lot of almost free languages, you know, that are, you know, I wouldn't claim to know it, but if I wanted to sit down and read it based on what I've learned before, it's, it's very easy to read it. And then conversely, when you learn a lot of languages, you say, well, I can read this language, probably I could speak it, but I've never done it and I haven't, you know, I can't claim to do something I haven't done, but, you know, I've got enough studies, so I, I probably could if I were thrown into it. So, um, yeah, I don't know how to answer that question. Thank you, Matthew. I think we're kind of gone over an hour now, so maybe we ought to, you know, again, I'm very happy that people watch the entire uh, lecture, and I hope we've had an interesting enough discussion that people are going to want to continue this format. I've enjoyed this. I hope you two have. And I think that, um, yeah, I would like to continue with this format. I don't know that two is the uh, best number of people to have. Maybe three would be, you know, a bit more lively. But then again, you wouldn't have as much time to talk. What would you think? How would you like this to be? What would, he, what would you guys recommend next, next time? How many people should be here? Maybe aim for, uh, if, you, if you aim for four, then one mm -hmm. person might not make it and another person might have something that comes up. If you right. have... If you have, I don't know, eight people, then I'm sure not everyone will. Someone will have something that comes up, and it will. That's up good being advice. Six Matthew, or five. I, I aim for I aim for four. <laughs> and we got here with two, so that's it. Um, I if, think if, three. Yeah, three yeah. is okay. Yeah. Three yeah. is okay. One more. We'll okay. If, add more. Mm -hmm. I think putting more than that would would mean people would start getting euphoric. I guess. Mm -hmm. um, Fill the screen. One, one more person here. Last I've, words, Matthew. This, yes, last words. Um. Uh. So. So I do like the teacher training stuff, and sometimes if I come late, I'll come, and there are six people, and they're just waiting for me to start. Um. For me, it it doesn't make any sense if everyone's waiting for me to start. So I I think that the people who do come. Like, like today, like we should be more prepared. Like we should go through the comments, select them, put them mm -hmm. in a Word document. Um, when we start up, you could, have you used breakout rooms before? Maybe yeah. um, we could put people in breakout rooms and they identify real quick. So we get some kind of structure to it, um, maybe. Okay, yeah, you know. if we have enough people to put in a breakout room, I mean, how would we do that with just three of us? I put you two there. <laughs> true, true. You'd, yeah. you'd need um, more than four. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, um, thank you so much uh, for joining me um, and uh, for allowing me. We'll uh, put this out there for others to watch in lieu of our question and answer and hope that um, others say, hey, uh, that was interesting. And I'd like to have that kind of conversation. And 
goal is to give this opportunity to everybody who wants it. So um, thank you and uh, we'll continue. Thank you. Right. <laughs> thank you. Have a good week. You too.